Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Zaina Kayat. I uh, am the Innovation Sherpa and Chief here at the Reshape Center and Innovation Center in the Netherlands and the host of the Global Network of Health Innovation Centers. I'm also a board member and part of the Innovation Learning Network, uh, and this is our joint program. So, welcome to the world. I think I've muted most of you. Um, okay. Can I just forward this? So just a quick orientation, since some of you are new to these two organizations, uh, the Innovation Learning Network on the right shown here uh, is a membership of health systems and other players around the world who really are bringing uh, good design into innovation in health and care. It has been around for more than 10 years. Um, my organization normally in Canada, Mars, is a member and mostly US based, but also UK and a few other countries innovation teams have been working on teaching and exchanging and learning innovation. Uh, technology has been part of that journey, but not the, the, the sole focus. The Global Network of Health Innovation Centers formed at the Exponential Medicine Conference of Singularity about two years ago with um, uh, health systems from around the world that said, we really got to get ahead of exponentials uh, that are impacting health and care and business models. And, uh, and so we kind of got together as collaborators and started this network and we've joined forces with the Innovation Learning Network to, um, to, to merge some of that work together through this series. Uh, the, the collaborators in the network focused on these seven exponentials that really we see have the potential to transform uh, the lives of patients and the performance of health systems. And uh, we've been doing one a month of reviewing uh, and giving kind of a state of the state. And this month, the focus is blockchain, uh, tons of hype, maybe some reality, and we'll kind of figure out the answer between those two uh, shortly. And so that leads us to um, our guests today that are gonna really help bring some of that clarity as we explore these. So what we normally do in all of these sessions is we start with somebody who really knows the space uh, in a, both a health and a non-health context, and there isn't anybody better than Dom Tapscott. He literally wrote the book. Uh, and I was at the book launch, uh, uh, one of them in Toronto, and it really blew my mind. So thank you, Don, for joining us from Toronto. Uh, and then Michael Dillingen, who's kind of touches many things that are emerging in healthcare, uh, including applications in blockchain, uh, will take us deeper into uh, what does this mean for healthcare and what's going on kind of around the world or what he, in the parts he sees. Uh, he's American, but lives in Switzerland, of course. Uh, and, then, and then we'll go into real use cases from two perspectives. One from Fred, who's on the innovation team at the Karolinska Hospital in Sweden. And then from a, a tech innovator bringing solutions to the market. And we've got uh, a switch today. Um, Asar, who's the chief revenue officer of Ubase, one of the first startups uh, in this space. And, and I always get excited when I see names like Eric Topol on the advisory board of a company like this and Dawn. Um, and so that's uh, who we have today. We have Twitter handles for everybody. Uh, and so I am gonna stop sharing my screen uh, and Dawn, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, we'll hear from each person for about 10 minutes and then we'll, we'll tackle some questions. Oh, just one sec. Uh... Share the screen, did I? Yep, you're all set. We have the sharing economy and a little <laughs> microcosm here. <laughs> um, well, sure, let me um, just do a general introduction to blockchain with a, with a bit of a focus on healthcare and how it might be pertinent. Um, this is, uh, these are 16 chapters from a book that I wrote um, about six years ago, it was called Macroeconomics. And we argued that the industrial age is finally coming to an end. That for many years, we've had these old models of doing everything, of institutions. The industrial, uh, industrial age was really an age of scale and of standardization. For something at the top or something with knowledge or power in the center, pushed out standardized units to passive recipients, mass production, mass marketing, mass uh, media, mass education, mass healthcare, mass whatever. And um, we pushed out products and uh, advertisements and TV shows and 
newspapers and radios and lectures and so on. And it was all one way. It was one size fits all. The, um, the recipients were typically passive and it was controlled by the central force. So, it, you know, if you look at something like, I don't know, universities and schools, it was, I'm a, uh, I'm a teacher, I have knowledge or a student, you don't get ready, here it comes. And uh, it was focused on the teacher, it was one way, the student was passive in the learning process. Well, arguably, notwithstanding all the debates that exist today in healthcare, they're all within this industrial model, where it goes like this, I'm a clinician, I have knowledge, you're a patient, you don't, I provide healthcare to you, and you only get it when, the, when you're in the system, which is why it costs so much. And police don't, you know, don't try and manage your own health by collaborating with others or going on the internet because you're going to get bad information. Well, that model, I was a model, I'm just going to shut my door here, was a model that worked for a long time, but it's now being obviated by some interesting new models. So this, this, this final stage of the industrial age really is, uh, is, is uh, couched in the rubric of the fourth industrial revolution. And we've got all these technologies now that are infusing themselves into everything, into the physical world, into our bodies. Uh, we have technology that learns uh, to do things that it wasn't programmed to do, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so on. And insofar as all these technologies will play in our institutions, in our companies, our governments, our hospitals, our, our economy, they will need an underlying transactional platform. And that's what blockchain is, the underlying technology of cryptocurrencies. And the way that we like to think about it here is that this is nothing less than the second era of the internet. For the first era, 40 years, and it's actually it was 40 years ago I began researching uh, the impact of works, the multifunction workstations connected to this thing called the ARPANET. And I um, wrote a book on that in 1981. That I think my mother bought most of the copies, but anyway. Um, the, what we had was an internet of information. And when I send you some information, whether it's a uh, you know, PDF, a PowerPoint, uh, an email, I actually am sending you a copy. Even with a website, I keep the original. And that's great for information. But when it comes to assets, things of value that belong to somebody, uh, sending a copy is a bad idea. Uh, assets like money or stocks or bonds or, or contracts or loyalty points, it could be intellectual property, it could be like a, I don't know, a patient record, art, music, cultural artifacts, a vote, even something like a carbon credit or energy, even our identities, which is a superset of a record, patient record. Copying these is a terrible idea. You don't want someone copying your identity or your vote. And if I send you a thousand dollars, it's really important that I don't still have the money. So cryptographers have called this the double spend problem for a long time. And the way that we manage the problem in our economy is through middlemen. Banks, governments, credit card companies, social media companies, other softer middle players like lawyers and so on. And they provide all of the business and transaction logic for every type of commerce. They identify the party, it's really you, or they identify the asset, that's really a stock. Uh, they clear and settle transactions, they keep records. Overall, they've done a pretty good job, but there are growing problems. Um, they, and there's a long list. I won't go into them here, but a big one has to do with data. Data is the new asset of the digital age. It's created by all of us, but they capture it asymmetrically, which means that we can't use this data to better plan our health, our lives, um, our personal economies. It means that we can't monetize this data. And in fact, the, the upshot is that it's being monetized by a tiny handful of these digital conglomerates and other big institutions. And, and we have growing prosperity and declining, sorry, growing wealth and declining prosperity. The economy is growing, the middle class is shrinking. 
And ultimately, our privacy is undermined too. So what if, what if there were not just an internet of information? What if there were an internet of value? Some kind of vast global distributed ledger or anything of value from money to art to votes to our identities could be managed, stored, transacted in a secure and private way. What if there were a native digital medium for value? Well, that's where Satoshi comes in. Anonymous person or persons solves the double spend problem in 2008. And the focus, of course, today is on Bitcoin as an asset class. And it's sure gone up in value. Um, but Bitcoin as an asset really should be of limited interest only if you're a speculator. Bitcoin more broadly is a cryptocurrency not controlled by a nation state. That has some interesting use cases. But the real pony here is none of that. It's the underlying blockchain technology. For the first time in human history, people can now transact, manage assets, things of value, peer-to-peer. Um, -peer. And trust is not achieved by a big intermediary. It's achieved by cryptography, by collaboration, and by some clever code which is why Alex Tapscott and I, uh, my son, call it the trust protocol. Trust is native to the medium. Now, it's not all about Bitcoin, of course. There are lots of other blockchains. Hyperledger from the Linux Foundation, IBM's behind it. Ethereum has a market value of, I don't know, $35 billion, but that's not what makes it important. It's a platform for general purpose application development. Sort of like Bitcoin, was the first big app of the internet of value. Like email was the first big app of the internet of information. But now we have these new platforms that look more like the web. They're platforms where you can develop any app using capabilities built into them like smart contracts. We have Cosmos that's building an internet of blockchains, linking blockchains together. Um, and using a, a different kind of uh, uh, consensus mechanism than say uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, which right now use miners and proof of stake. We have the, the transaction and vol volume problem is slowly being solved. Companies like Ripple say they can do throughput at visa levels. And so, yeah, sure, the hype cycle has started. So over a year and a half ago, The Economist did a cover story on blockchain, calling it the great chain of being sure about things. And um, people say to me today, man, there's so much hype. And I reply, I know. It's like 1994, and there was so much hype about this thing called the internet. You know, there's a, look at all that hype. It's a ton of it. So, um, you know, we're, we're in the early days here. I'm not going to talk and speculate on the value of cryptocurrencies, but this is just beginning. So to, to close, what does it mean for healthcare? Well, this is the old stereotype, you know, that I have knowledge, you, I'm a clinician, you're a patient, you don't. And um, that's a big problem. And at the heart of all of this is the notion of, of an identity. Each of us have this identity, and the identity contains our medical record, but it contains other health information, like you know all the prescriptions that we've taken, or the diagnoses that we've had, or the you know exercise that we've had, and and all of that is a tiny subset of our overall identity as we leave this trail of digital crumbs as we go throughout life. And these crumbs are collected into the virtual you. It's a mirror image of you. And the virtual Zena knows more about her than she does because she can't remember what she said a year ago or what diagnosis she had a year ago or what she bought a year ago or her exact location uh, a, a year ago. And the trouble is that the virtual uh, uh, Zena is not, is not owned by her. It's owned by Facebook, it's owned by Google, and it's owned by um, the banks and governments and big healthcare institutions. What if the virtual you was owned by you? A portable identity on a blockchain where when you left the hospital after an x-ray, your radiology report was in your identity. 
and where you could use that radiology report to help you plan your life to get a second opinion. You can anonymize it and, and monetize it uh, if you wanted. You could link it with others to do your own research. Um, that would be the tip of the iceberg of a very, very extraordinary thing. So I come at this whole issue of healthcare largely, or initially at least, from the point of view of identity. That if we can have an identity as a patient or in any other institution as a student, we can move away from this you know, teacher-focused model of education, this clinician-focused model of, uh, of education, where we could uh, you know, have identities that are verified, where um, when every, every baby that's born gets one of these identities, it's portable, it's really stingy about what information it gets up. A lot of transactions, you don't even need to know who the, who the buyer is as a seller. You just need to know for sure that you got paid. And this could be the foundation of creating health information exchanges, new collaborative models. Patients like me was just the beginning where patients can collaborate together and co-innovate and co-create their own health. This identity in a blockchain will be at the heart of all kinds of monitoring systems as hospitals become full of smart communicating devices and that reach out to the smart devices that are on our bodies and in our bodies. And this could also be at the heart of making some big claims in uh, medical insurance as well. So um, th these are some big opportunities. And um, it really comes down to leadership, which is why I'm, I'm very excited about this webinar. And uh, at the Blockchain Research Institute, we're doing 70, 70, uh, projects and um, uh, uh, some of the people on this webinar are collaborating uh, with us and we're, we're doing a bunch of work in healthcare and from a whole number of different uh, angles so if any of you are interested in knowing more about that do let me know okay back to you thank you Don thank you for that overview it really set the stage it's amazing uh, how much clarity you can bring to what seems like a, a complicated concept um, okay, if you can, uh, you've unscared your screen, and then maybe Michael, you can pop yourself in, um, and we'll go a little bit deeper. I think Don really set the stage for health, so uh, over to you, Michael. So, yeah, thanks. Let's see here. Can you yep. see my screen? Yep, perfect. Great. So yeah, I I, um, I was introduced uh, in a large part to blockchain by Don and his son, Alex. Uh, they really are pioneers in the space and, and they've done a tremendous amount of work and effort and trying to get everybody beyond the technical concept of blockchain and into what really the promise of the technology is. I, it's a, kind of funny thinking about all the articles getting written about is it hype is it not where you know is it a boom is it a bubble is it a bust and um, it does sound uh, quite familiar to some of the other big uh, things that have happened to us in the last 20 years from a technology perspective that went on to become everyday um, things so and thanks Sana for uh, inviting me appreciate that um, it's always good to speak with such a great group of uh, peers in the audience so um, what I thought I'd just go over today is a brief overview of what's going on with blockchain and distributed ledger technologies in healthcare, who's doing what, um, what, uh, what the technology brings to bear, um, both near term and we, what we hope long term. And, uh, and then, yeah, I think I uh, look forward to hearing the questions at the end uh, of, this, uh, of this webinar. So to get started, I, bought, I borrowed a, um, a nice map of uh, what's going on in blockchain uh, from a healthcare perspective um, from Andrea uh, Korovos. If you haven't been to her website, um, it's almost as good as Ana's, uh, but um, it's, it's really nice. They do, she, she's done a nice job of keeping an open source um, database of companies and then mapping them out to what they do in that space. It's, if, if anything, this has been a, a little bit of a challenge, particularly from the startup's viewpoint. I'm sure we'll hear about that later, um, about where they fit in the ecosystem. You can also, if you're on GitHub, you can 
push this um, push this out as it's updated. So, um, you know, if there's a, a couple of really big, uh, I'll call it areas that uh, blockchain healthcare startups are focusing on. Um, there's this idea of a data infrastructure, um, much like what you see in the cloud space, services, uh, uh, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. Um, some of these names, if you uh, have been involved in uh, blockchain for the last two years or so, uh, will be very familiar. Um, and some of them are, are new and they're, they're looking at different areas of, of how to deliver um, the blockchain as a service. And then we have um, the, I think the long promise as we'll talk about in a little bit of blockchain and that's in the PHR and electronic healthcare record space. This is ultimately the, the big uh, prize at the end of um, at the technology uh, cycle. And there's some really great companies in, in this space doing some really fantastic work. And along with, um, you know, if you're collecting data, you uh, it's a really good idea to figure out what it all means. So there are a couple of uh, new companies that are showing up in the analytics space and they've got all the usual uh, descriptors um, that, uh, that analytics carries with it, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, we have one of my favorites in the med device space in IoT security. This is um, one of the, I think, interesting pieces of blockchain in terms of what blockchain does and doesn't do um, in, in healthcare. And there's a lot of um, confusion around whether it's uh, a se deliver security or integrity. And then we have identity, very, very key in healthcare without identity. Um, and without being able to handle identity separately, um, we, uh, we can never get to this idea of an easy to access, um, fully transparent um, data structure with clinicians, patients, and providers and payers. Supply chain, um, obviously uh, pharma is um, well represented in that. There's a lot of very good reasons for um, talking about uh, supply chain in pharma, and I'll go over that very briefly uh, today. Digital medicine and care delivery for um, med adherence. Um, it's uh, unfortunate but true, but there's uh, amongst the four top selling uh, pharma uh, med meds, the pharma meds, as opposed to some other med. I, don't, <laughs> I just got off a plane. I'm trying to uh, use that as my excuse all the time, but there's 7 billion missed doses amongst the four top selling meds. Um, on the planet, and we need to figure out where that's all going and, and how to deliver better systems for that. And then finally, there needs to be some sort of um, tools and services and consultants behind all of this to help to put it all together. And there's some really great names in that space as well, people that are doing some fantastic work. Um, uh, a couple of those I met for the very first time when I went to spend a little time at the Tapscots way back when, um, way back when, three years ago. Okay, so go ahead and see here if I can operate this. Um, so blockchain big seven. Um, when we talk about technical features in blockchain, you know, I think it, there's a lot of different ways, and I, this is one of the fun parts of how blockchain is discussed. Um, everybody's got a little different way of putting this together. So pardon me if it, it's not the, what you use, but in general. Um, blockchain promises to deliver um, on identity, um, anonymization, provenance, where did it come from, um, availability, is, is my thing working or not, transaction validation, I think we're seeing a lot of that uh, in the news, obviously around the monetary financial aspects, fintech um, advantages of blockchain, access or transferability, um, again, very important, and, and ownership, who owns something. Your real estate or your um, your health information, your your health data, as uh, Don referred to um, as as an asset. The question, um, though, this is the, the 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 challenge, if you will, or the the fun part of doing this as a startup, and and then big companies like IBM and Microsoft, who are getting into the mix pretty heavily, um, is do they all make sense for healthcare and life sciences? Um, and healthcare and life sciences, when I say that, meaning the current technical problems that they're facing. 
And when I say makes sense, I usually mean, um, is it financially viable? So let's talk about what the blockchain promise in healthcare is um, currently. And I think what you see is you've got, um, you know, a very big problem in clinical trials in pharma. If you don't know that it costs a lot of money to develop um, uh, treatment, uh, pharmaceutical treatments, then you, you may uh, have been living underneath the log for a while. The, the latest figures, um, it's, it's always on the rise, but they're inching closer to $2 billion dollars. Um, for a drug to get from discovery all the way to the market. And of course, that, those costs um, are borne out um, not only in the, on the research and development side, but also on the, on the post-market side, on the LOE side, where um, we pharmaceutical companies need to understand what's happening um, after you've taken a fully approved drug. And these are all, um, it's a supply chain nightmare. Um, you've got a lot of um, issues around the integrity of the, the clinical data, and there are um, a lot of there are a couple of big companies that are doing quite well. Um, just uh, focusing on that space, um, non-blockchain companies. Um, I don't want to sling any arrows in this uh, presentation, but if you're in healthcare, you know who that is. Um, how do we get patient courts? I mean, one of the one of the things that uh, is often uh, a really a key indice of the success of a project is how quickly can I put together a cohort that represents a large enough sample size to um, to prove out my point? And it's quite difficult. Um, it seems like on the surface this wouldn't be a big deal, but you know, expanding the size and the diversity of the patient course of clinical trials is is, is quite a uh, expensive undertaking. Um, you know, again, on the post-market side, understanding the downstream research um, and how that impacts the patient. I remember talking to an ex executive with um, a large pharma company a few years back, and we were at a, a dinner, um, uh, a private equity dinner, and he told me, he said, I said, if, if there was one thing that you could do, um, and only one thing, um, in pharma, and this is a multi-billion dollar company, what would it be? And he said, I want to be able to reach out to patients slash consumers like, co like Coca-Cola does, like a fast moving consumer good company does. But um, for, for lots of good reasons, that's, it doesn't work quite, doesn't work quite, quite that way. Um, and then, you know, once you've figured out what, the, what makes sense for the patient um, and you've got um, some level of understanding on the adherence, the ability of the patient to take the medication, What's, how do we integrate those treatment regimens um, with the patient capacity for, you know, what the, 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 the disease that they're managing? Many patients with chronic diseases have a number of comorbidities. Dialysis patients um, don't die of kidney failure. They die of, uh, unfortunately, um, cardiovascular disease issues. Um, and um, and that's, that's a problem because we don't have any mechanism with which to understand what that means. Um, from the supply chain perspective in general, um, we need to think about you know, the safety and quality control. How do we deliver these things? There's a, a lot of the uh, pharmaceutical uh, chains, uh, large companies, Boots Alliance, um, have made uh, big inroads around this. And now we just heard from uh, probably one of the biggest of the biggest uh, platforms for delivering things to consumers, and that's Amazon that they're getting in the space, but we're not talking about delivering a vacuum cleaner here. We're talking about delivering really uh, uh, very expensive, very um, delicate uh, meds that have um, you know, disastrous consequences if um, not handled properly. And, so, and, and when that happens, how do we recall them? And these audit trails and things that are really um, important around our current systems, but it makes our current system extremely and I say our, um, as Andy said, I, I'm a permanent resident of Switzerland, but I uh, am a U.S. citizen, so I, I get the burden of talking about our wonderful uh, U.S. Um, uh, healthcare system. Um, go Canada. So complexities of patient care. Um, again, that's what I referred to earlier. Is, you know, we need to get to a system that has the ability to deliver care in our information about what is happening with that patient from a med perspective, from a med device perspective. My um, 
Other thing I do when I'm not on webinars with really interesting people is I'm an investor and I'm involved in companies that are delivering interesting medical devices. Um, and there is going to be a very large um, initiative around tracking those medical devices, and particularly when those medical devices aren't actually devices, but they're software. And they're collecting an enormous amount of data from us. If you want to have fun, you should read some of the interesting um, analyst calls that uh, are being had with large data companies and med device companies. Um, a big surprise, they're all coming together. And I don't mean that as a, oh no, the, skull, the, the, the sky is falling down. But I do, I would underline again and again, Don mentioned it, it's a data play. It's absolutely a data play. And in the EU, I just recently gave a, a speech to the EU Parliament um, a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about all these new initiatives in the EU around medical devices, and they're actually rolling up all their medical device directives from each country into something they're calling the MDR, which is an overarching regulation about how med devices will be tracked and audited, and the data that comes from them and how they'll be classified. Another fantastic opportunity for blockchain to try to sort some of that out. Great. All right. Am I run out of time, Zena? Yeah, maybe you can kind of connect us to the, the next use case. Um, is there something yeah. here? Yeah, I sure will. So I'll just um, skip over the last part and say we do need to chat. We do need to uh, solve for interoperability. Um, how this patient data ownership story happens, what DNA identification means. No, it's not a storage medium. Yes, it needs to be scalable. And yes, we need to continue to do great webinars. Adoption. And I will pass it on um, to uh, my colleague, friend and peer from Carolina, Frederick, to talk to us about that use case. Great. Thank you. Uh, I could tell, uh, Michael, like if I prick you to spew data about this stuff, um, we could probably listen to you forever from all your lived experience. So thank you. All right. Well, let's Thanks, go a bit, a bit deeper. And, and Michael and Don, if you can, there's quite a few questions that I know we're not going to get to because <laughs> we'll have 10 minutes for questions. Anything you can opine on in the chat, please do. It'll be terrific. Um, Fred, let's go uh, hear from you about uh, a complex health system, which the world recognizes as world leading, uh, and, and, and how are you approaching this? Oh, just unmute, Fred. Are you muted? Uh, I'm muted. There you go. There go. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, as uh, Saina said, I'm representing Karolinska University Hospital and the Center for Innovation there. Uh, it may be uh, familiar to you, but uh, at Karolinska, we work along the vision of patient first, uh, where we provide quality and safe healthcare with the best expertise. So this is uh, related, in our case, to blockchain, to put the patient first. And we're also very uh, well connected to the Karolinska Institute and their research program. Uh, quick fact sheet, we have 1,600 beds. Uh, we have 1.6 million patients visits per year and about 16,000 employees. So it's a, it's a fairly big uh, system uh, consisting of two hospitals, two sites. And uh, we work strategically with, with questions like this, uh, innovation, exponential medicine in, in various ways. AI is on, on everybody's radar and also on ours. And in, in terms of blockchain, yeah. one could ask, why, why is it important for us? Because we have a good healthcare system. We have a, a good tradition of recording data, uh, quality data, uh, research data, all of these things. Uh, we also realize that blockchain will be the single most disruptive technology in terms of patient empowerment. And we want to help patients get more uh, power uh, to work with their own health and be aware of what's what's going on uh, after as we heard in the examples before us uh, when you do a radiology um, uh, visit uh, you want to bring the data vi with you so we want to unlock the latent value of data in silos today by enabling sharing such data uh, and sharing them in trusted networks um, 
and we want to provide a mechanism for securely managing transactions um, without the intermediary and to keep the data trusted between uh, the different stakeholders. Uh, the intermediaries we have today, hospitals being one, um, will likely be disrupted. And from our perspective, we need to be prepared, uh, really. We want to provide our patients and doctors with good solutions for research, for, for health, um, but also see where we can be uh, keeping an important part in the system, obviously. And we're exploring this now uh, together with uh, currently three, three companies, actually, uh, Intel, uh, Microsoft, I think are, are familiar to, to, both, uh, to most of you, uh, but also a, a Swedish company called CareChain. And together with, with them, we are now experimenting in, with blockchain in three areas. We're looking at general patient data for patients to carry their data with them, so to say, and, and be able to share it with other caregivers for second opinion, and, and just to give them the possibility and the opportunity to own their data for, for real. Uh, Michael talked about it a little bit, and we are looking at the trusted device data, or data that comes from the, the devices that are, are now entering the market. And the third, focus area for us and uh, use case is a professional reputation system. I will go into a little bit more detail on each one of them. And as I said earlier, blockchain will be the single most disruptive technology in terms of shifting the power healthcare versus the individual patient. So gen we cannot overlook um, or skip general patient data. We need to see what we can do with the general data and how we can uh, approach it. And then even though we own all the data today, we realize that data needs to be liquidized. And in order to unleash its full potential for patients, for doctors, nurses, and researchers. And we think that patients should have instant access to their own data. And for various reasons, um, Research being one, uh, second opinion in other healthcare providers, uh, another. In terms of research, we think that our approach is that blockchain has a chance to democratize research. It can speed up uh, time to market. It can increase the cohort in, in research studies. Um, Possibly it will be easier to involve more patients and you can also ask patients to take part in studies without an intermediary. Uh, so for convenience. Trusted device data with more and more approved healthcare devices uh, on the market. Uh, we think that patients or consumers, uh, they don't have to be patients, uh, need a possibility to keep their data and, and also make it possible to share it. And this also goes for the apps that come with these devices, such as Strava, Nokia Health, or other standalone apps such as LifeSum, for instance. Because in our hospital, the doc we know the doctors and nurses encourage patients to work out and uh, move around but we cannot follow up. There is no chance for our doctors to really see or trust um, what they are doing in terms of exercise and, and diet and, and things like that. It's a very, uh, today it's a very complex and, and uh, clumsy way of, of entering this data into any kind of sheet that we're using. Yeah, sheets, sheets. And on the other side, our staff, also need a way to look at this data and the, the data needs to be trusted. So the, this is the second area that we'll be looking at. And the third focus area that we're working with now 
I think is is probably most interesting to us. Uh, the professional reputation system. Uh, and for various reasons, we want to explore the pos possibilities of putting registered occupational categories on a blockchain. Uh, one reason being uh, the development of dig digital health and also in, in combination with general globalization, we need a trust chain uh, primarily for doctors. So we need to trust their credentials uh, as a patient, but also as an employer, uh, with Karolinska being both an attractive hospital and a university, we have to make sure the credentials are in place and that they can be trusted. And the trust here should be based on data and not charisma, so to say. So uh, this is the, the third one that we're working with. And, and um, when I say the development of digital health, if you're able to log on, and see a doctor and, and the doctor claims, uh, she says, I am, have spent time at Karolinska, I was trained at Karolinska. Uh, there should be a way to um, make sure that that is uh, the case and that's true. Um, not good for the patient otherwise and not good for us. And we know these kind of doctor visits will increase uh, rapidly. And um, as we heard also the, the previous uh, presenters say, we are, we are challenging. And I also got a few questions regarding this already. Um, we are challenging a few things with this and things that we have already noticed and, and learned. Uh, we're, we're challenging the current IT structure and the architecture, uh, which is, I think, a must. Uh, we have to do that. Uh, with that, we are also challenging regulations. And in our case, it's national regulations and also EU regulations that we enjoy challenging. We're also challenging knowledge. Uh, we're challenging the level of knowledge in IT specialists, in doctors. Um, and that is probably the toughest part together with people's general mindset on who should be owning data and what should they be able to do with it. Uh, so we have the, the technical side, which uh, it seems that we can solve uh, at the moment. Um, but the other side is, is uh, change management uh, at a fairly high level, I, I'd say. But we are all, uh, there are many of us that are thrilled that we are doing this at the hospital and we hope to see some uh, results during uh, next year. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, we're, we're inviting you back, Fred, next year to give the, uh, the results uh, story. Perfect. That's great. It seems that of the members of the Global Network of Health Innovation Centers, everybody's kind of at this stage of kind of trying things. There's not that many vendors, to be honest, so um, it's a good update. Okay, well, uh, you get the last word now, um, Ahar, and uh, I think he's the chief revenue officer at Ubase. Uh, Leonard is with some customers, the, the CEO of Ubase. And so um, let's hear from a, a startup that's grinding in the field, uh, trying to bring these solutions uh, and, and create solutions with patients and with clients. Over to you, Ahsar. Hi, can you hear me? Can you yes. see my, my uh, presentation? All set. My face a little bit off. Um, Hi guys, thanks so much for having me. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about um, blockchain and healthcare and Ubase specifically. So Ubase is working in healthcare and other industries to create a new uh, data storage solution that is a lot more efficient and more utility uh, compared to what we have today. It increases interoperability, security, uh, as well as uh, the access to data all in one. And, uh, you know, we don't call ourselves a blockchain company. We call ourselves an applied cryptography company because we're borrowing a lot of the concepts that have been developed in this industry, but they are deeper than Bitcoin or blockchain. They are uh, just cryptography concepts that are being applied to this old healthcare market. So 
you know, why are we doing this? And this is the Eric Topol plug. Um, you know, we own a, our data. It is our body. But uh, the joke in the industry is that the, pers the only person who doesn't have access to their data is the patient. You know, you can, your, your doctor might have access to some of your data, you know, your insurance company might have access to some of your data, but you as the patient, you know, do not have a view of the data. And even though we ourselves uh, manage our health uh, most of the time, 99% of the time, we ourselves don't know our health as well as these providers uh, that Don has mentioned earlier that uh, a centralized and controlled access to uh, the healthcare system, meter it, make it more expensive, uh, make it difficult for us to take care of ourselves. And so how do we get here? Uh, sort of the reason why we are in this situation today is because the technology that was designed to share data was developed many years ago before the internet uh, and we're still stuck on this technology today in terms of Epic and Cerner and all of these uh, big guys in healthcare that are controlling the actual data. Um, so what we're doing, ooh, that just went fast. So what we're doing is applying cryptography to enable the patients, the people who own the data to control to control it uh, in a better way. And we do not say that we solve interoperability uh, completely, but what we do is we change the dynamic where instead of trying to work with the individual hospitals, uh, we try to work with the patient, we try to enable the patient to collect their data and to share the data to change the uh, data paradigm, maybe not 180 degrees, but at least 90 degrees. So there's a few uh, reasons for why, um, why applied cryptography is, uh, is a good approach for all, for all these uh, problems. It's, uh, it is secure um, because, because the public-private key pairs don't allow for anybody else to view the data. It is pa patient-centric so that you, the patient, actually control what is going on in, in your, in your, with your data. And it is privacy. Um, privacy is very core to, to the solution. Blockchain type technologies automatically uh, lend themselves to being, to, to acting in a way where privacy and security are enabled versus uh, a uh, versus a, a silo approach of client server where you have to spend a lot of time doing doing the security enablement. The way that we see the ecosystem with UBase is we have a few components. Uh, mainly, currently that I'm talking about is the data storage component and the uh, the wallet. The data storage component allows for the data to be stored. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but the data component allows for data to be stored in a simple uh, addressable manner where each piece of data could be stored uh, in a way where it could be called out. So it could, you could look for specific values, for example, without looking at uh, the private identifiable information. And the way that it functions is that the data might reside on a custodian within our own system or in a custodian within the Kaiser system is just stored in our form of database. And then once it's stored in our, in our uh, type of a database, the wallet component allows us to exchange keys to sort of open doors to uh, provide access to the individual pieces of data. Um, so if you wanted to, for example, share if you wanted to share the data from your uh, lab values, for example, you can provide the key to the lab values, to your doctor or to an analytic system that wants to analyze your data and be assured that they're only able to access that granular part, nothing else. Um, 
if you compare us to the existing solutions out there, we are, you know, if, if you look at the world of sort of generated data, um, obviously there were EMRs, but now most of the data is coming from, as somebody pointed out in the chat, it's coming, I think Xenia, it's coming from wearables and other patient generating devices. So as this flood of data is happening, we have um, aggregators and we have uh, many connections that are not standardized. What we propose is creating a, an extra layer uh, that makes it, uh, that makes individual players compatible with each other without having a third party system to uh, control and transmit the data. Basically, uh, by providing an open standard, anybody could become and transmit the data in a secure, reliable format uh, through UBase. And uh, again, our main goal is to enable very granular uh, individual centric control of patient data. Um, we believe that by doing so, we can enable the patients to make a difference in their lives, which will over time make a difference in the cost of healthcare, uh, because most of the time you are managing your own health. Uh, we've done some work in Canada, actually. Um, we launched a pilot with Self-Care Catalyst and MedChart, where our company is... Uh, yeah, I will answer some questions after, after my talk. It's hard to do both. But uh, essentially, we're working with these two companies to enable the gathering transmission of data for, uh, a, health, for a rare health condition. And... Uh, MedChart is acting as a data aggregator, collecting data from the healthcare system, um, and then sharing it using UBase to self-care catalyst to enable uh, patient control and security. And then self-care catalyst is utilizing data to create health reports to improve lives. So again, the value of uh, UBase is, uh, could be summarized in, in a couple of main things, which is you know a secure cryptographic solution and framework, uh, an aggregation of patient information, um, an aggregation of patient information into one uh, unified source, um, yeah, and so that's pretty much the end of it. Um, and uh, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, you know, people are asking how do you how does um, blockchain technology uh, help healthcare, you, you know, the, the, the thing of specifically uh, blockchain technology in healthcare or in other industries, it is not a solve all, uh, you know, a silver bullet, the, the cure to cancer, the cure to like, you know, degenerative diseases. Um, it is not that. It is a technology. It makes data more accessible, more liquid, uh, it makes data easier to use, uh, more, program more programmatically, programmatically digestible. Um, the real question then becomes, what now? If, if the world has this technology, how do we, the people involved in the industry, actually come in and move the puck forward, put something uh, that is actually using this core tech to help the patient, to help enable you know, better care. Um, that's the real question. And, and when you ask that question, realistically, you have to treat uh, cryptography, apply to cryptography, blockchain, whatever, as a new technology that has a lot of promise and has a number of problems that is still being figured out. So when you guys kind of like go, on, go beyond this webinar and you think about this, you know, you, don't, you should just not think about the hype. You should just think about, okay, new technology, more efficient way of doing things, how does that help healthcare? That, that, that's it. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Aksar. I think there's lots of questions in the chat you can kind of work on if you can unshare your screen. Um, we're close to the end of time. So what we'll do is maybe if our, if our guests can stay on for a little bit longer and whoever wants to stay on, uh, let's work through some of your questions. Um, I just suggest that uh, you guys just knock off whatever you see that is worth, uh, you think you could answer, try to answer quickly so we can try to get to as many as possible. 
Um, anyone wanna wanna jump on one or, or should I curate here? One. I'm just trying to get to the chat. Can I see them there? Um Uh, I think there was one that I thought was really interesting, which was, is there interoperability for blockchains? There's, is, that, is that not the right question? So all these different healthcare blockchains, can they kind of connect to each other? Has anyone had experience with that? Yeah. Um, so to answer your question, it is a real challenge. Um, maybe not as bad as the interoperability in the healthcare sector in general, but there are a lot of blockchains in healthcare. There are a lot of blockchains uh, in and outside of healthcare. And interoperability will be a real issue. Uh, figuring out how to make these uh, different blockchains interoperate, interact is going to be um, a real challenge. Uh, you know, as as all these things become more and more popular, uh, it's a problem that people are working on. It's a problem that we're working on as well to try to allow for, you know, interactions, different chains. Um, it's definitely a valid problem. All right. Um, another question that's on your, if anyone wants to unmute themselves, of course, please pipe in. Um, I think there was a question here. Maybe Michael, you could talk about uh, reply to is a, uh, part of the um, inefficiency of clinical trials is recruitment of patients and accruals. So anything you've seen on impacting recruitment of patients into research studies and the whole data conversion um, from uh, the, the health system to the patient? Yep. Actually, uh, Oxar made a, one of the, uh, the use kit, commercial use cases that uh, he uh, presented is a great example of um, how that might work. So on one side, you have a startup that's focused on building a care coordination platform. And on the other side, you have a startup that's uh, focused on building um, you know, management tools for uh, patient recruitment and, and marketing studies and things along those lines. The big, the big cost factor in the recruitment side of things is, um, one, you've got to be able to it's a, it's a marketing, it's, it's marketing on top of marketing. You've got to be able to attract people to come in and find those people and attract them to come in. So if you have a care coordination platform where you can reach out to people very selectively fully in a fully consented manner, that covers that piece. And the second big cost, um, once you've uh, gone out and identified um, in a very simple manner, who might be good candidates for your clinical trial getting them to uh, put that information in, to you know, share their information, to have their clinicians share their information. One of the things that comes out of a lot of this you know, discussion around the mechanics of care coordination and clinical trials is it turns out physicians aren't super thrilled about losing their patients, just like anybody else, a customer and a, uh, you know, a provider, if you will. So with that, with that interesting relationship, you pre-populate a lot of what's already in the patient's EMR into their clinical trial uh, piece. So you've, you've reduced the cost of finding the right patient for the trial, and you've reduced dramatically the cost of um, putting information in. You know, it's just crazy that you have clinical trials where you're replicating information that's already in the patient's um, uh, electronic healthcare record. Yep. Okay, I think we're, uh, we're we're at the end of time, so maybe I'll just, um, for our, I think Don might have had to leave. So um, why don't we just get each of our guests to give one final statement of what's your big take home message? There are lots of questions in the chat and they're really juicy. So if you can stay on and try to answer a few of them yourselves to our guests, that would be great. Otherwise, uh, we'll keep the dialogue. Um, so maybe I'll start, um, Fred, with you. Any final statement as a, as a complex health system trying to, to explore this technology? Yeah, sure. It's uh, <clears throat> from healthcare provider perspective, it's, it's about starting to experiment uh, on your own and trying to build a network ar around you that is, is competent but close by uh, to begin with, I'd say, so you can 
start experimenting in, in smaller batches and, and get clinicians on board and, and so forth, but start experimenting. Great. And, and SR? Yeah, I, you know, not to sound like a, uh, a repeat uh, record, but I think the most important thing is to look at this industry uh, with, uh, so with sober eyes and sort of think, you know, of it as uh, a technological tool that's new, that's promising, that needs a lot of things to be figured out and kind of look at it from that perspective. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, it's great for the startup, you know, and you're the revenue officer to talk about sober. <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> yep, very good. But I know this isn't your first rodeo. I saw all your exits. So thank you. Uh, and then Michael, I guess you get the last word. <laughs> oh, geez. You're, now you're talking dangerous. <laughs> uh, so I, I think just to key off of what uh, my colleague said, but it's important for organizations that see an opportunity, you know, the, the different, very specific ways that blockchain might be able to solve problems for the organization is to develop some expertise internally um, by reaching out externally uh, and attending webinars like this. You know, I think that I watched, I've unfortunately watched large organizations with lots of resources stumble around, if you will, um, with problems that weren't solved weren't going to be solved with blockchain and um, so education is is really key great okay well thank you everyone thank you gentlemen this is a five country effort and i think there we have 120 participants from all around the world uh we will be posting on the genic website uh the recording as soon as we're ready uh, uh, the slides from our guests and the chat transcript uh, as, uh, within the, hopefully the next day. And uh, keep your eye out for the next, next ones. Thank you very much, guys, for being part of this and all of our participants for your great questions and tweets. Thanks, Anna. Great, Thank you. great webinar. Great. Yeah, well organized. Thank very you, everyone. Well. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. <laughs> Bye.